Welcome to Energy Talks, the podcast for energy nerds and intelligent folks who like interesting conversation. Uh, today's guest is Colin Simpson, Dean of the Center for Continuous Learning at George Brown College, located in Toronto, Ontario. We're going to be talking about training programs for solar technicians. So welcome to the interview, Colin. Yeah, thanks very much. It's glad to be here. This is before we get into the discussion of the programs themselves and how they work, and and I, I'm kind of want to set some context here because Ontario back in oh 2008 2009 was a bit of a, a pioneer in Canada in terms of wind power in particular not so much solar but wind and then there was a backlash against that and a lot of the, you know the, some of the wind turbines were taken down and it didn't look like Ontario was in any rush to adopt renewables but uh my take on this from 3 or 4000 kilometers away on the west coast is that the increase uh, in demand uh, growth that we're seeing, uh, you know, 2% here a uh, year in BC, 3 to 4 to 5% in some states in the United States, that's changed the calculation. And now all of a sudden, uh, government system operators, utilities are much more interested in solar and wind to supplement established, you know, hydro and nuclear and so on. So basically the renewables take up the growth. Is that a fair way of looking at what's going on uh, in Ontario right now? Yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, again, you, you referenced 2008, 2009. That actually was a time when there was a change in government. And, and prior to that, um, with the Liberal government, there were a lot of incentives and subsidies in the solar side, particularly, uh, you know, these energy credits and things for actually even being able to feed power back into the grid, uh, which was very popular. So you still see some of those remnants if you drive through the countryside here, out of the GTA in Toronto, a lot of solar farms and things that were built, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And there hasn't really been a lot since then. The wind farms a slightly different issue in terms of the, the NIMBY folks that were really against that and a very effective lobbying group around that. But solar, it was really intended back then, as it is today, to be a, a real self-sustaining initiative in the sense that if you made that investment in solar technology, particularly as a residential homeowner, you could recoup that investment in a relatively short period of time. So I think that's been the change. Now, hopefully, uh, with, with the Ford government, they are going to revisit that, um, those, some of those incentives maybe to, to, to kickstart the solar industry back here in Ontario. But as it stands right now, people are still just on their own, that they are making those investments without the benefit of any, basically any subsidy whatsoever. Um, there probably is some federal subsidies, right? I mean, there's the Green Home Program, and and the little there's a little bit at the federal level, even if there isn't any at the provincial level. Correct? Correct? That's true. It, it's really more about these re renewable energy credits that were very popular, the the ability to sell energy back into the grid. Uh, that's really at the provincial level. But you're right. At at the federal level, there are certainly some uh, incentives for for renewable energy. Right. And what we're seeing is the, the solar panels in particular uh, being used in different configurations. So you'll see them uh, big solar farms uh, at the utility scale level. You see some community solar. Uh, you'll see a lot of res residential solar now paired with storage. Uh, I suspect that we're going to see um, electric vehicles very soon will be used as storage uh, for residential solar. Uh, one of the interesting ones is uh, industrial and big commercial, which, of course, Ontario is the manufacturing center of Canada, where uh, bigger operations are looking for not only to lower costs, but also resilience, you know, in case of an outage, uh, that's very important for them. And so we've got these different business models uh, and usage models emerging within the industry. Is that what we're seeing in Ontario? Yeah, to probably not to the same extent, at least yet, that what you might be seeing out in Western Canada. But what's really driving this power demand for us in Ontario are these increased use of data centers. And a lot of times now we're seeing a, a growth in microgrids as a result, where they need to have this power in relatively remote locations that, that aren't easily accessible to uh, to the grid. And so they're building their own. And, and definitely we're seeing a growth in Ontario in those type of microgrids where for some of the reasons you just outlined for that resilience that, you know, they've got to run 24 seven, they got to have an uptime 99 plus percent. 
So these energy providers that are looking at doing that type of development are heavily focused on this microgrid notion and definitely the industrial side of it as well on the manufacturing. We have acres of, of flat roofs here that would really work very, very well for, for, for large solar installations. And of course, the ground mounted systems as well. But there's a lot of flat roofs, in, particularly in southern Ontario, that could really benefit from, from a solar installation. Sure. So let's talk about the, the trades that are involved in uh, the solar technical side of this, uh, this uh, industry. And uh, are we talking about retraining electricians? Would that be the primary focus here? Well, our, our market, and this is why we've launched two programs. Uh, one is a solar panel installer, and the other is a solar energy technician. Now, the, there, there are a lot of similarities between the two, but the, the installer, we, a lot of the students that are, are our target are really not even necessarily at the technical skill level of an electrician, but might actually be people from trades like in roofing, for example. If you don't have a fear of heights, you're a good candidate to be a solar panel installer, right? So roofers are a natural fit for that on the installer side. Um, but there's also a lot of, obviously, a lot of solar energy techs as well that would be installing panels on a roof. But generally, uh, they might gravitate more to the in industrial commercial side of it. Uh, but electricians are a great candidate for either of those occupations but particularly on the solar energy technician side where they're expected to do more troubleshooting of the inverters and the battery systems and, and some of the control electronics that go with it, as well as also having the capability to tie some of these installations into the grid where you might have to be a, you know, a certified electrician if you're working with a, a power utility to do those actual grid tie-ins. Now, we've heard a lot about trade uh, uh, shortages of tradespeople. And so if uh, some of these folks are coming from other trades and some of them are coming from the electrical trade, um, is that going to put a strain on the pool of, uh, you know, uh, trained uh, uh, tradespeople uh, in Ontario if they're shifting over to clean energy jobs? There, there, there may be a, a, an impact, but what we saw, like we launched our electric vehicle tech program about five years ago. And it was geared really specifically to auto mechanics to upgrade their skills and electricians to install the solar, uh, or sorry, the electric vehicle charging stations. And in that case, I mean, it was, a you know, we're, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of, of, of tradespeople who were looking for a, either upskilling or reskilling. So what we saw with the electricians was it didn't necessarily take them away from that occupation, but it added to their skill set. And this is kind of what we see with the solar panel uh, program and the solar energy tech program. And we actually modeled this. We worked in, in close conjunction with an organization in the U.S. called NABCEP, which is uh, they're kind of the main accrediting body in, in, in the U.S. And so they vetted our curriculum. We had a lot of discussions in terms of employment opportunities, cross-skilling, reskilling, and And this was kind of their point as well, that with the electricians, it just gives them another tool in their tool belt, in a sense, that they've got that skill, they can do solar installations if need be, but it doesn't necessarily take them away from some of the other occupational work that they might be doing in residential or commercial electrical installations. Oh, that, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm seeing this uh, uh, debate play out in uh, some of my social media where I've got... Uh, uh, you know, electricians would be a good example, and they belong to IBEW, you know, the big uh, international uh, electricians union, and and they're debating the role of the union in training. They're debating, you know, where are these jobs going to be? Are they going to go through the union hall? Or are they not going to go through the union hall? Those sorts of things. And I imagine that the same sort of thing is playing out in uh, in Ontario. Yeah, very much so, Mark. The, uh, the IBW is a big, obviously plays a huge role here in, in Ontario as well. They've got some really great training facilities uh, that are part of that. But and, and electricians are such an essential part of the skilled trades in general that from our perspective, we just see this much as we did with our, our EV program, that we were providing those electricians with additional skills that, you know, whether they're working for an electrical contractor who may get a, a contract to do an installation of a charging station, it's the same thing with the solar panels, that it may not be what the electrical contractor does exclusively, but they need to have skilled personnel so that if a contract does come up where they say, well, we've got a, a solar installation that we need to do, 
we can assign these electricians to that work because they know how to do it. And again, so much of this work, as you can appreciate, is related to the electrical code. When we're talking about solar installations, you know, the Canadian electrical code is, is, is the, you know, a really essential document or, or a Bible in a sense of, of what they're, they're working off of to make sure that it does meet the requirements of, of the electrical inspectors. And regardless of what jurisdiction they are, whether Ontario, BC, or anywhere in the country, the Canadian Electrical Code is the reference document. And even though it's, there's not as much information in our Canadian Electrical Code about solar as there is in the National Electrical Code in the US, it nonetheless does address it, as well as CSA also plays a big role in terms of assuring that, that there's certain codes and rules and regulations that we abide by. So electricians are a natural fit in that sense, because if you, if you become a journey person, you've already been quite familiarized with various aspects of the Canadian Electrical Code. So for them, when they talk about, okay, you know, grounding requirements or, or you know, the, the circuit breakers and, you know, ampacity requirements, it, it it's really lends itself perfectly to the skills that the electricians already have. So this just helps to kind of move them along uh, and acquire these additional skills. One of, one of my most uh, enjoyable parts of going through my social media is watching electricians post stories about things that are not up to code <laughs> right. and, and the horror stories that they run into. Anyway, I digress. Um, well, let's talk about how this program is actually offered. Uh, is it um, a, a case where they have to, you know, they're coming into a classroom or or into a shop and they're getting hands-on stuff? Or but it sounds like, from what I'm reading, that a lot of it is uh, self-paced on on the internet. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this program, this is these two are actually the ninth and tenth programs that that we offer in this format in terms of online technical training. We started with electronics many years ago and. I've uh, moved into robotics, automation, uh, programmable controllers. So it's a, it's a space we're very familiar with, asynchronous on-demand training. When you look at that type of a training modality, most educational institutions, they stay away from that because part of the challenge is how do you do the hands-on laboratory stuff? And my, my background, I, I'm, a, I'm an electronics professor, uh, in, in, in my previous life. And, and the biggest challenge I already always had in those environments, I'd be teaching a class of students, electronic students, one third thought I was going too slow, a third thought I was going too fast, and the other third thought maybe the, the pace was about right. Now with our online tech programs, they set the pace. The students decide the rate that they learn with. How we got around and solved this uh, hands-on piece was by simulation. And we've developed some amazing simulation tools and again, we've got a long history, 20 odd year history of doing this with electronics, robotics, and it, it was a natural fit for solar, much as we did with electric vehicles and wind turbine techs as well, that all of that is done by simulation. So it's really worked well. For us, it helped to break down that barrier. If somebody's working full time, they can't just quit the job to go to school. Uh, even on a part-time format, there's very few institu institutions that offer robust training in the evenings and on the weekends. And even at that, a lot of people, as you can appreciate, have work and family commitments. And so being able to say, okay, Tuesday night at seven o'clock, that works for me, turns out the next Tuesday night doesn't work. So by allowing them to decide when they can study, it's really broke down that barrier of, of having accessible education for people who are employed. Maybe you could describe a little bit about how these simulations work. I mean, as soon as you say simulation, I'm starting to think things like uh, aircraft training, you know, where you're you're sitting in a cockpit and piloting a simulated aircraft. Um, so how does it work exactly? Well, that's actually a great example. And that's the one I used to use many years ago when I was going around the country telling people that you can learn electronics without actually being in an electronics lab by using simulation. And I always use the aircraft pilot example because it's such a great one. And it's true, like when we think about programmable logic controllers or robotics, that they are in a simulated world when they're studying with us. Now with our solar programs, we're really focusing on troubleshooting, testing, debugging, looking at the actual calculations so that if somebody's gonna do a, a solar panel installation or, or you know an array or a solar farm, they need to be able to calculate, is this properly sized? And so our simulation software allows them to test that before they actually do the installation. 
So they're not really putting on a VR headset with our solar. It's more about the running simulations to verify that the equipment that they are planning to install can actually handle the requirements of the installation. And then we also use them extensively for troubleshooting. If there's a problem with an inverter, here's what it could look like. If you're connecting to the terminals, this is a waveform that you should see when you're troubleshooting. We go through all of the standard test equipment that they would use in the field, and then we simulate that equipment when they're using it in one of our virtual labs. Oh, that's that's absolutely fascinating. Um, well, Colin, this has been a, a terrific overview of your program, and I think that we're getting a handle on this kind of training in Canada. Uh, and maybe I was going to wrap up the interview, but I, another question occurred to me, uh, and that is, uh, I'm seeing the pace of change in other parts of the world. And I think of the Ameri uh, United States. I mean, down there, it's not, you know, they got an aging grid. Uh, demand is growing at three, four, five percent. Uh, utilities can't get enough solar panels. They can't get enough wind turbines. They can't keep coal online. I mean, they're just pulling out their hair. Canada's not like that. We've had a very stable grid, low cost, reliable. Everything's been fine. We're just now starting to see the kind of growth that other uh, other regions have seen uh, uh, a few years earlier. Is there that kind? Is that kind of uh, the, the pressure now for change and for growth within the industry? Are we starting to see that accelerate? And are we going to see more of these kinds of programs where we're upskilling, reskilling, introducing you know folks to to new industries entirely? Are we going to see a lot more of this going forward? Uh, I, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And that's why we pivoted a few years ago towards clean tech. And that's why we've launched a solar program, our, our a wind turbine. And now, uh, you know, even with the electric vehicle, it's, it's just as popular as ever with, with the EV kind of stuff. So clearly the, the power demands that we're facing as a country, it's not going to be one size fits all because even when you look at Alberta, right, who, who they've always been the big leader when it comes to fossil fuels and oil and, you know, a, a, a really strong uh, fossil fuel sector. But they're also a leader in solar. There's some amazing uh, progress that Alberta has made in Saskatchewan as well on the solar side. Ontario, Quebec, we've been lagging um, and, and there's a big opportunity for us there. That's why I talk about a lot of these flat roofs that are sitting empty where they should be full of panels. Um, so there's a growth curve, there's a trajectory in place. I think these data centers with AI is driving a lot of that growth now. So we're going to see it in Ontario. I know you folks in, in, in BC have, have always been ahead of the curve when it comes to clean technology. We actually looked to BC when we were developing our, our electric vehicle program because you guys were so far uh, ahead, much like California, the West Coast was really uh, ahead of that. And so with solar, yeah, we are very confident with or without subsidies here in Ontario, there's a demand and it's going to be bigger. When we think about even in the next five or 10 years, it's going to be huge. It's a massive, massive increase in power requirements right across the board. Well, Colin, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Glad to be here.